FBC fam, welcome to worship. Beckett and I hope you're staying very cool right now during the hot summer months of Arkadelph. You know we're praying for you, you know we're hoping for a football season as we prepare for college students and everything else coming back this fall. FBC fam, let's worship together. Hello, FBCA family. We are Scott and Katie Haynes. And Suzanne. And Julie. <laughs> and we are coming to you on this video from our home in... Thanks, Morocco. Uh, we know many folks have had questions about the COVID-19 situation here in Morocco. Um, so we wanted to give you a quick update on that, especially since that's why we're still here and not with you in person. Um, Morocco went into a state of health emergency in the middle of March. Uh, since that time, we've had a really strict quarantine. There have been about 16,000 cases and only 250 deaths, which has been great um, to have numbers that low, but a large part of that is because of the very strict quarantine. Um, they are starting to loosen just a little bit though, which has been nice to get out a little bit with the kids. Um, to go a couple places where they had not left the house uh, for about three months straight. Um, but we've actually had a pretty good summer uh, so far here as a family. Even though it's really, really hot <laughs> in the desert here. Um, we do want to say a thank you to all of you who have kept up with us on social media, um, who have supported us so diligently, financial and otherwise, and we can't thank you enough. Thank you so, so much. But we just want to give you a brief three quick main ideas to keep in mind to um, ask the Father on our behalf, please. Um, so the first one is for the borders of Morocco to um, safely and hopefully timely open up. Um, right now there's no air traffic uh, between Morocco and anywhere else. Um, slowly they are allowing Moroccan citizens and people with um, valid visas to live and work here in Morocco to, to come back to Morocco, um, but that doesn't allow for new teachers to come here. Um, we have a good group of teachers who are hoping to all arrive here um, this uh, fall, and right now only the ones who were here previously can return, um, but the new ones can't come right now. So we're hoping that the borders will open up in a timely way to allow us to get more people here um, to do this work with us. Um, number two is for our school. Um, we really are asking the Father for safe reopening um, that is done in a way that is meaningful and helpful for all of the students. Um, if you are in this position with students of your own, if you're a teacher or you have kids or grandkids and you're thinking about all the complications for opening up schools in the U.S., um, we are experiencing those same stresses, but just within a different government status, and it's really difficult to predict what that might be like. On top of that, um, if you had any experience with homeschooling <laughs> in the U.S. and maybe the challenges that would come with that, Imagine, on top of that, a language barrier. These students are learning in English, and most of their parents can't even help them with that homework um, and to further their education at home. You know, and COVID has been really difficult on the economy here in Morocco, so private education, like ours in general, has really taken a hit, and we've been a part of that, taking significant pay cuts in order to just keep our doors open. Um, so just so many challenges. The list goes on and on when it comes to social distancing in a classroom and masks and teachers and all of that. So that's a really big um, heavy thing on our minds is, is how, can, how can we be a part of that process in a good way that shows who we are and uh, represents the Father well. And number three, um, establishing new partnerships with universities here in our city um, to provide English teachers for them. In early March, I was uh, involved with a couple of really exciting and excellent meetings that just went so well. They were ready to sign agreements and then, well, we all know what happened a couple of weeks later. Um, so there hasn't been a falling out, there's just been a, we have to wait and see. Um, so with Katie and I being here right now, we're trying to uh, move forward and continue the talks with those same people at those same two universities here in Fez. 
Um, so please lift that those universities and those uh, university administrators would still be excited to bring in our teachers, um, that we can come to an agreement that is mutually beneficial for our teachers and, and our organization and for their school and their students, and that we would even be able um, to place teachers this fall, this September. This is our big goal um, is to start relationships with universities in this country. Um, so this is really where we want to go. Um, we, again, we just wanted to give you this real brief update, um, but we do have a couple of Zoom meetings that are scheduled in there. We can ask, you can ask questions, we can tell a few more stories, um, we can see your faces, which is what we really want to be able to do, um, and just connect on a more personal level. So what that's going to entail is us jumping on a Zoom call, um, and we have two of those scheduled. So if you want to hop over to someone else's Sunday school for a day and hear some more personal stories, um, we'll be glad to get you a link for that and um, make sure that you guys can get on that Zoom call if you would like to hear more. We love you. We thank you. Um, we're so glad to be partners with you. We miss you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. See you soon. We want to begin by reading the opening two verses of Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. So let's sing together forever. Stand with me as we sing. once again and worshiping together. But God has told us that we were created to sing and to praise him. So let's proclaim that together as we sing. How great thou art in number 10.
seated for a moment. I want to take a moment to imagine yourself <coughs> in Isaiah's shoes, as Jimmy shared with us last Sunday from the first chapter of Isaiah. What if we were to be transported to heaven and be to behold the majestic power of God and saw him seated on his throne? Would we become more aware of our sinfulness as we saw the greatness of God? Thank God that he has atoned for our sins through Jesus Christ. And that is something that should really excite us. Let's sing it together. I see the Lord. Stand with me now as we sing. Let the words of the psalmist be your words as we sing. As the deer pants for the streams of living water.
you alone, you alone are our heart's desire. We do long to worship you. Thank you for being present with us in this place. What an awesome God you are and worthy of our praises. Thank you for your love for us. Even when we lose our focus, we forget how amazing you are. When you were growing up, did your parents ever have to teach you the same lesson more than once? Did they ever have to say something like, how many times do I have to tell you to, and then whatever? You know, you can insert your own particulars in there. I think it's safe to say that we've all been there. Sometimes we just need to hear those words of instructions more than once. This is how it goes with parents and children. And this is also how it goes with our Father in Heaven and us. If you read through the scriptures, one recurring theme you'll notice is that God's people mess up all the time. They sin, they rebel against God, they mistreat others, they worship idols, they do every crazy thing you can imagine, and then some. They misbehave in the Old Testament, they misbehave in the New Testament, and we still misbehave here in 2020. And one of the lessons we as God's people have always struggled with is one that is repeated ad nauseum in the scriptures. We struggle to love our neighbors. And it's not just because we have bad neighbors either. The problem is ours. I sort of think God's people could live next door to Mr. Rogers and still have a tough time loving their neighbor. And that guy's a good neighbor. Jesus himself taught us time and time again how important it is for us to treat other people with care. And he made it pretty clear that he meant everyone. He said you should love people of other races. He said you should love prisoners and widows and orphans and the poor and lepers and crooks and phonies and even those people who want to nail you to a cross. You love them all, he said. And this wasn't even the first time that God taught this lesson to his children. You know, we sometimes need to hear a lesson more than once, right? This lesson is taught throughout the Old Testament as well. The prophets in the Old Testament were really the ones who did the heavy lifting with this. They confronted God's people when they got off track and they constantly reminded them, love your neighbor, treat other people justly, do right and stop doing wrong. God's people needed to hear this message again and again, just like a rebellious child would just like we do. For the next several weeks, we're going to turn our attention to the Old Testament prophet Amos, a man who God used to deliver this exact message, as well as others, to his people. I would encourage you over the next week or so to read the book of Amos in its entirety. It's not too long, only nine chapters. And as you read through it, let God speak to you through the scriptures as you study and pray on your own. For our purposes today, I simply want to give you an introduction to Amos the person. I want to tell you a little bit about him, and I also want to set things up so that you'll understand the context of the message that God delivered through Amos. Let's start with Amos himself, shall we? What little we know about Amos comes from the book of Amos. He was definitely not a well-known figure in his day and age. So what do we know about him? Let's look at a couple of verses together. We're going to start by looking at verse 1-1, one, one, and then we're going to turn to chapter 7 and look at verses 14 and 15. In verse 1 it says, The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. That's it. Verse 1, The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. And then in chapter 7 it says this. This is actually part of a conversation between Amos and a man named Amaziah. We'll get to who Amaziah is later and what they're, why they're talking to one another. But this is what Amos says to him. He says, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd. And I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. I have just read to you all of Amos's biographical material. That's it. He was a shepherd. He was from a small rural village named Tekoa. He took care of sycamore fig trees. He was not a prophet's son or any kind of religious dignitary. Before his calling, this 
is who he was. Now, a couple of quick notes about this limited profile of Amos. Uh, the word for shepherd used for Amos here is one that actually refers to someone who would have coordinated the work of a group of shepherds, like he would have been a shepherd for the shepherds in some ways. So he wasn't just out with the animals all the time. He did work with people too. Also, I did a little bit of legwork on the sycamore fig tree thing. Uh, these are obviously a different type of tree than the sycamore trees we have here in Arkansas. Uh, the trees that Amos worked with grew small figs, whereas ours are pretty inedible. Uh, that was, listen, this was Amos' life. That's it. Those are all the details. That's all of the digging I could do on Amos. Uh, he would have done all of this really exciting stuff in a village that in a lot of ways sounds like the place where I grew up. You know, it's rural, not a lot of people, probably didn't have a movie theater. And if it helps you to place uh, Tekoa just on your mental map, just so you can kind of get an image of where he was, it was about 10 miles outside of Jerusalem. All pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? You might need to pause and stretch. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're getting the point uh, that this was an ordinary guy. You aren't going to be dazzled by Amos's biography because there wasn't anything dazzling in it. He was actually kind of boring. And yet, this is the man that God called to be his spokesperson. <clears throat> now, at this point, we've already looked over all that was written about the person Amos. But I think we can read between the lines a bit. And if we do, we can make some pretty good inferences about Amos's character. And this, I think, will help us to understand why he was selected by God. If we do this, uh, the first thing I would point out to you is that Amos was faithful. He must have been a man who loved and lived for God, or else God wouldn't have called him. Just a simple inference. I would also say he must have been someone who treated others well. So much of the message that God delivers through Amos revolves around Israel's unjust treatment of people. Israel was using and abusing people left and right and profiting from the misery of others. So for God to have selected Amos to deliver a message like that, I think we can assume that Amos didn't struggle with this. He must have been a man who loved justice and did right by his neighbors. So he's very much a Mr. Rogers type character here. He says, uh, also I would like to point out to you that Amos was a man of great courage. Just think about what he did. At the time that God called Amos, God's people were divided into two kingdoms. There was the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. You can see a reference to this in verse 1 of the book of Amos, where in giving the setting of the book, it says this, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, we read that part earlier, says what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. So you get Uzziah, who was king of, of the kingdom of Judah, and Jeroboam, who is the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, this particular time in Israel's history was one that followed a, a period of military success and great material gain for the northern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel was prosperous and powerful by the world's standards. And this was the kingdom that Amos was called to rebuke. Little, boring, nobody Amos, a shepherd from the small village of Tekoa. And not only that, but Tekoa, Amos' hometown, was in the kingdom of Judah. God not only called the shepherd to speak out against a wealthy and powerful kingdom, he wasn't even from that kingdom. He had to go on the road and do this. He was called to speak truth to people in power in a land that was not his homeland. You know, it could not have been easy. But because God asked him and he was faithful, he went. He was not only faithful, he was brave. He was courageous. You know, in a lot of ways, when I think about Amos, and maybe this will help you out too, uh, he reminds me of a hobbit. He is this humble guy who lives a good life in the country, and he gets called out of his peaceful existence and sent out into this corrupt, dark, enemy territory. And God uses this ordinary hobbit-like guy to accomplish his great purposes. As we wrap up our look at Amos the person this morning, I really want you to see how significant Amos's insignificance was. 
I want you to see just how much God likes to work through humble, faithful people. In Scripture, we don't really see God recruiting the rich, the powerful, or the influential. He often selects the shepherd, the fisherman, the tax collector, the smallest son. He selects people that the world overlooks. He uses people that the world might think of as weak. And through these weak, ordinary folks, God puts His power and His might on display. Through these ordinary people, He shines an extraordinary light, and He is glorified. So what do you at home do with this information? My hope is that you'll let it inspire you. Perhaps you feel that you aren't important enough, or smart enough, or good-looking enough, or popular enough to be used by God. Listen to me. If your own low opinion of yourself has held you back, then wake up today to the fact that you are a beloved, redeemed member of the family of God. And all He wants from His people, all He wants from us, is for us to love Him and be faithful to Him. And if you can do that, then you are qualified because He makes you qualified. So walk humbly with the Lord and know that He will call you on an adventure of your own. Will you pray with me? Kind Father, we do thank you so much for blessing us with every good thing in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your Spirit. Help us to live each day in the Spirit. Help us to live each day in humility and in service to you. You are upright and just. You do no wrong. Help us to be like you. We love you so very much. Amen. Church family, until we see each other again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Have a wonderful week.